Hello once again and welcome to our next module. In this module, as you can tell, uh, we're going to be taking a look at the issue of eggs. And in particular, some of the ethical questions that are brought up by the way eggs are produced in America uh, today. And this is one of uh, a number of different modules where we will be looking at specific aspects of the American food system. Last time we looked at uh, the impact on the environment, in particular water pollution um, from agriculture and the, the application of all kinds of chemicals to crops like corn and wheat and soybeans. Uh, in this module we're looking at the treatment of animals and we'll continue that again in the next module and then we'll go on and look at uh, other issues as well. And uh, what I want to do in this module primarily is uh, again on a maybe larger scale than we did last time introduce you to uh, the debate that's going on in the country right now about egg production. Uh, so really what I want to do is just uh, set the stage for that and then ask some questions uh, at the end. Uh, and in the middle of the module, I really want you to uh, look at some videos produced by the two different sides in this debate, namely by the egg industry uh, and then also by uh, a news program investigating uh, the industry and some critics of it. Uh, now, again, just to set the stage uh, very basically, uh, we've learned about the Green Revolution or the Revolution in Agriculture uh, that took place in the 20th century in our content book uh, and elsewhere. And the same thing happens uh, basically in uh, animal uh, husbandry. Uh, what you have is a, a real transformation from the kind of farmhouse model that Konkin talks about in his book where every family has a few hens in the backyard and maybe the country people come in and, and sell some city folks. Uh, and you get a move from that to uh, more and more uh, consolidation and concentration so that people who keep producing eggs get bigger and bigger and bigger uh, to make better use of and more efficient use of the increasing technology uh, in the industry. And as a result, uh, that drives out uh, the smaller producers. So basically the same thing happens with eggs as happened with uh, the crops and other things that we saw discussed in Konkin's book. Um, and the end results are very much the same. Right? That uh, just as with, uh, say, corn or soybeans, in America today, uh, there are huge quantities of egg being produced uh, every day. And, uh, you know, taking into account inflation and those sorts of things, eggs are remarkably cheap today compared to previous generations. Uh, if you look at, for example, the the American Egg Board website, which I will point you to later on in the module, they'll talk about the typical dozen eggs costing about a buck fifty. Um, you can find uh, on occasion sales at places like Dillon's or Walmart where you can get them even for a dollar a dozen. So uh, it really is a very cheap source of protein uh, that makes up a big part of the American diet, whether it's in restaurants or whether it's uh, in home cooking. Uh, and so it seems like this is a huge success story, right? That we have large quantities of eggs being produced that are remarkably cheap and available to almost everybody. Uh, but again, as with the Green Revolution, there are certainly many critics of this model. Uh, and they basically argue that uh, the real costs of our exceptionally cheap eggs are hidden from us and aren't really taken into account. Um, so we'll be looking at some of those arguments here uh, in a few moments. And then ultimately what I want to uh, ask after we look at these two different sides in the debates is to think about how are we supposed to uh, decide who's right? And that's where I want to bring in some of the ethical ideas that we've been studying and some of the theological concepts we've been looking at uh, and then apply them to this specific debate. So to do that all, uh, let's get started on the next page. All right, so what I want you to do on this page in just a moment after you finish listening to my talking head uh, is to click on the little uh, image there of the incredible edible egg, which of course is the copyrighted uh, intellectual property of the American Egg Board, which is the big uh, industrial uh, industry group, lobbying group for American egg producers. Uh, and so I want you to click on that 
uh, and uh, take a look at the series of videos that are brought up. So there's, there's, you'd be brought to a page that has um, eight to ten videos that you can go through one at a time to basically see how the modern American egg industry works. Now, of course, as you're watching this, you are all uh, savvy media users at this point. Um, and so you're obviously going to be aware that uh, if the American Egg Board is putting together a series of videos about how eggs are produced, they are going to pick uh, the best and most appealing uh, production facility that they possibly can find. And there's no doubt um, that's true in this case as well. Um, but uh, as we're going to see here, one of the real arguments in this debate is not just um, are there some egg producers who are particularly bad and are cruel um, towards uh, animals, uh, and the egg industry at least would say that they reject uh, those kinds of practices. Uh, and so they would really argue they ought to be judged based on the highest standards that they promote. So I think it is uh, reasonable to acknowledge that we're probably getting the absolute best here in our video series, uh, but to also say that's maybe where we should focus our debate. If the egg industry really did uh, all of the things it claims it does and follows the standards it sets out, uh, would that be an acceptable way of uh, producing eggs for American consumers? Uh, and you'll see again as you go through the video, I think one of the big things that's emphasized over and over again is that, uh, well, first of all, of course, that they provide lots of product at a very affordable price. They're meeting the needs of American consumers. Uh, but also, there's a real emphasis on the fact that they are following the latest scientific guidelines, the latest uh, government regulations. And again, uh, now that you've uh, read the, the Konkin book, that should at least uh, make you pause for a moment and reflect on uh, what that argument is saying. Right? As you read, uh, the growth of the regulations, the growth of government oversight, along with the growth of uh, agricultural research and education, all of that is really intertwined with uh, the growth of American agriculture and the different uh, groups of uh, farmers or egg producers in this case or meat producers were all very intimately involved in the development of these different uh, government agencies, the development of the different uh, agricultural colleges or research institutions. And so uh, it's not really as if you have kind of the egg industry over here and then over here we've got scientists and government regulators and they're going to be very critically looking at the egg industry uh, and then offering uh, their proposals for how it ought to be changed. Uh, these two uh, groups or these three groups are very closely intertwined. Uh, the, the government uh, agencies which oversee the industry also, for the most part, serve the industry, right? That they're there to uh, promote the industry. Uh, and the same thing is true of uh, the, the academic institutions as well. They're not simply sitting back and uh, purely theoretically, abstractly figuring out what is the best way to, uh, to produce eggs, what is the best way to produce or whatever other agricultural product it is, that they are uh, driven by, funded by the ongoing agricultural work in the country. And so their focus is going to be on getting returns uh, and improving returns using uh, the current models. Um, and so when you have all these references to, oh, well, the agricultural experts all agree that this is the best way to do things, there may very well be uh, validity to that. But it's also something that we need to be at least critical in thinking about because, again, uh, these are not kind of objective scientists in the sense that we might think of a physicist or a chemist being objective. Uh, there are definite uh, ties to the industry, um, which are certainly going to shift uh, the kinds of questions the scientists ask, the way they uh, investigate different uh, procedures and possibilities in the field. So. Having said all that, uh, please take uh, a little bit of time here to go through the videos that take about maybe about 25 minutes all together. Uh, and then uh, once you do that, then go ahead and click on the next page here in this module. All right, now you've seen the uh, industry's perspective on uh, how they do things. And obviously, uh, they think they're doing 
a very fine job of it. Thank you very much. Uh, but again, obviously we wouldn't be having this module if that was the end of the story. There are quite a few critics of, well, of course, of American agriculture in general, but in particular there are quite a few critics of uh, the modern American egg industry. Uh, I say American here, but this is really kind of the modern model for egg production. Uh, and I, I make that point because the video that I'm going to ask you to look at next uh, comes from a 60-minute segment that uh, is produced in Australia where they're looking at egg production. Uh, but the methods being used there are very similar to uh, what's being used in the U.S., or at least has been up until uh, quite recently. Uh, and this will give you, uh, in this report, kind of uh, some of the key criticisms made about uh, the egg production uh, model in use in the world today. Uh, but just to uh, round it out and make sure we hit all the points in case the video doesn't cover all of them, uh, there are really a, a range of different criticisms that are offered uh, coming from all kinds of different groups. Uh, one criticism that's raised is just the quality of the eggs themselves. Um, and if you, you don't necessarily need to be a kind of award-winning chef to notice this yourself. Uh, you can discover it very quickly. You go down to Walmart uh, and buy cheap dozen eggs uh, and then go to a farmer's market or a roadside stand or something uh, and buy a dozen eggs from chickens that are raised outdoors in the kind of traditional pastoral model. Now, if you crack those two eggs into uh, a bowl, it would be very easy to tell which is which. Um, there is a real difference in terms of the quality of the eggs. Uh, traditional uh, range-produced eggs have thicker whites, yellower yellows, um, yolks. Um, and it really is a different kind of product. And so there's some people who are critical of the egg industry uh, just in terms of quality. And they'll also argue that there's different uh, health uh, impacts from the way the eggs are produced as well. Uh, so that's one debate. We're not necessarily going to focus on that um, here. Uh, another issue that's raised is the problem of overcrowding. Right? We talked before uh, in the module about how there's been a consolidation uh, in egg production, just like all the other uh, types of agriculture, so that you have fewer and fewer uh, farms where these eggs are being produced, but they get larger and larger and larger, so that you end up with uh, these barns, uh, which are really almost huge warehouses that are housing uh, thousands and tens of thousands of hens in them. And when you get that many uh, animals together, you're going to have problems in terms of dealing with uh, the manure that they're going to produce, uh, which can become a real uh, pollution problem. And then there's also issues with disease, uh, that when you have that many animals living together in crowded conditions, if disease gets in there, uh, it's going to spread very quickly and seriously. Uh, and there are also a lot of people who argue uh, that having that many animals together is a perfect uh, breeding ground for new diseases to emerge. So those are some other criticisms raised about this model. Uh, but really, in terms of uh, egg production, uh, the real focus is on uh, the treatment of the animals. We'll see the discussion of, of pollution and, and health risks and those things uh, more next time when we look at other animal products uh, in the agricultural system. But when we focus on, on chickens and the production of eggs, the primary focus is on animal cruelty. Uh, and this, again, has to do with just the way that chickens are raised uh, in modern egg production uh, schemes. Uh, and it starts off uh, from the very beginning when the chicks are first hatched. Um, as you probably all know, I don't know if you know, it's been a while since you had the talk with your parents, but uh, only the girl chickens lay the eggs. Um, the boy chickens, no, not so much. Uh, and so uh, when you are an egg producer, uh, hatching your next generation of hens. Uh, as it turns out, there's no way, uh, at least scientifically yet, to make sure they're all going to be hens. So you're going to end up with about 50-50 uh, male and female. What are you supposed to do with all of these non-egg-laying uh, chickens? Uh, and basically what happens to the vast majority of them is that they are simply uh, killed immediately after uh, hatching. They are either... Um, 
just thrown into garbage bins to suffocate or uh, they are ground up into animal byproducts for fertilizer or something. Uh, but they are all basically killed right away because you don't want to waste any money feeding uh, these uh, male chicks that are never going to really give you any production. So there are a lot of critics uh, who see this just as inherently uh, cruel and inherently inhumane to uh, kill all of these male chicks immediately after hatching. Now again, uh, some of those methods might very well be cruel, uh, but if we're going to question whether or not we can uh, kill agricultural animals, uh, that's going to raise a whole other set of questions about, well, does that mean we have to be vegetarians or vegan? Uh, which is not necessarily the argument I want to focus on at the moment. Uh, assuming, though, let's just uh, focus on the hens that are uh, hatched and then brought up and brought into egg production. Uh, well, what happens with them that critics focus on? Well, one of the things that's going to happen, or really the defining thing that happens, is they get put in these things called battery cages, uh, which are small cages that are uh, stacked immediately next to each other in, in huge rows, uh, and then they're also put on top of each other uh, for two, three, four uh, levels high. So you have these, these little cages where the hens are kept uh, in the cages. Um, and one of the problems with that is that if you keep chickens uh, closely confined with other chickens, uh, with nothing else to do, they're going to peck at each other. Uh, and this can cause all kinds of injuries. Uh, and as somebody who just raised chickens myself, uh, once a chicken gets an injury, and the other chickens uh, will basically peck at it uh, and make it worse and worse, uh, and eventually will kill the chicken. And so to prevent this, uh, the chickens are de-beaked. Uh, that is, as chicks, they are uh, put into a little machine that uh, sears off the end of their beaks, which makes it not possible for them to uh, peck each other that way. And uh, there is quite a bit of argument that says that this is painful, uh, and that the pain uh, goes on for quite some time, uh, which seems like a reasonable uh, conclusion. So you have the debeaking, de which a lot of people uh, oppose. Uh, and then there's also just the uh, way these chickens are then housed for the rest of their lives, uh, that they are kept in these battery cages in these huge uh, warehouses, essentially. Uh, and the whole focus, of course, is to maximize their egg production with a minimum amount of input. Uh, so yes, they are kept, uh, or it seems at least in the following industry practices, they're kept clean uh, and kept uh, well-fed and hydrated. The question is, what do they uh, do besides stand there, eat, drink, and lay eggs? Uh, and the answer is uh, practically nothing, right? That they are kept in cages to the point where uh, each hen is given the space of about a sheet of paper, which isn't really enough space even for them to turn around, to spread their wings, uh, and do those sorts of things. They're kept on the wire uh, floor cages, which uh, seem to cause problems for their feet. Um, and beyond this kind of just being uh, held in this very small space, there's no opportunity for them to do any of their natural uh, activities. Chickens, by nature, by instinct, like to scratch the ground and uh, look for bugs and uh, strut around and do their chicken pecking order thing. They like to perch. They like to uh, like to lay their eggs in dark, secluded places, right? So none of these things are possible in this battery cage uh, model. And so many critics would argue that uh, this entire model of egg production is uh, flawed and it is unnatural and cruel to the animals, which basically moves from treating them as an animal that has a natural habitat, natural activities, and turns it basically into a biological machine where you put feed in one end and get an egg out of another. So again, uh, we'll leave that there for now, and you can watch this video yourself. I think it's about 16 or 17 minutes. Uh, and then we will uh, move to the next page in the module to uh, wrap things up and move on to our questions. So we're faced with two very different perspectives on the way egg produced in America today. Uh, on the one hand, we have the industry, which says the production model is efficient and safe and meets the latest scientific recommendations. 
uh, and argues that uh, any sort of change to an idyllic vision of chickens, roaming pastures um, uh, will be basically unaffordable and will leave American consumers hungry. On the other hand, you have the critics of the industry who argue that even at its best, uh, the battery cage model is uh, inherently cruel uh, and basically forces these animals into a lifetime of unnatural conditions where they're overcrowded, they're forced to molt, they're forced, they're deep beaked. All of these things happen to them, which basically are uh, painful. Uh, and don't really recognize them as animals and basically treats them as uh, machines. So the question is, what are we supposed to do, right? Which side is right and what are we supposed to do about it? Now one thing to mention just at the very beginning is uh, if you go to the store, uh, you will see that this debate is starting to get into uh, the popular consciousness and the egg producers are aware of this. And so when you go to the store, you'll see uh, other options for eggs uh, being sold there. You will have cage-free eggs, uh, and you will have free-range eggs. Uh, so maybe these are the models, right? Maybe there's different industrial methods of producing chickens that will avoid the problems. Um, and to make a, a long story short, um, these aren't really uh, meaningful changes uh, to the industrial model, right? When it says cage-free, uh, all that means is instead of being kept in these battery cages, the chickens are uh, put on the floor of giant warehouses uh, where they live in the same crowded conditions. Perhaps they can move around a bit more. On the downside, uh, chickens are by nature social and hierarchical, right? They make a pecking order, which I'm sure you've all heard of. Um, so they'll establish a social hierarchy in their little um, flock, which lets them all know where they stand. Well, when you're kept in uh, a warehouse with thousands or tens of thousands of other chickens, that's never possible. And so the chickens live lives constantly battling with each other uh, to figure out what their pecking order is, but it can never get resolved as it does in the traditional size flock. And there are still all the other problems of overcrowding and unnatural environment, those things. Uh, the free range hens are really essentially the same thing. Uh, that just means you have your cage free model this big warehouse full of crammed full of chickens uh, and at the least what you do is you put a little door at one end that opens out onto a little bitty yard where the chickens could at least in theory go outside uh, but as it turns out chicken nature being what it is they're not going to be the one chicken to go out there uh, outside uh, that the chickens will basically all stay uh, in the warehouse and so it doesn't really change anything except now we have a door on the end of our warehouse. Uh, and so the other industrial models really aren't going to be a change. You would either need a, a real change in the industry to much smaller uh, farms where there was an actual uh, amount of space, the chickens were actually outside a significant amount of the time, where they had uh, room for perches and nest boxes and those sorts of things, uh, which would certainly uh, cost uh, quite a bit more, and at least in the transitional period would cost quite a bit more, um, and would require a lot more people to work in the industry, and would certainly uh, require us as a country to put a lot more of our resources into egg production than we currently do. Uh, and so what should we do? Should we stay with the current model, with its cheap eggs, but um, real criticisms, or should we move to an alternative model? Uh, which would address or could address many of those criticisms but would cost quite a bit more. And that's the decision I would uh, put putting forward for you today. Um, and then the way to answer that question, of course, is going to depend uh, on our basic beliefs, right? And that's the whole point of this course, is that our basic beliefs are going to shape our choices in everyday life. And so the question is, well, what really is our goal, right? What is it that we are aiming for? Uh, and how do we reach that goal? How do we reach those goals? Uh, if our goal is to uh, maximize pleasure by maximizing profit and free time, well then it seems pretty clear which model we ought to use. Uh, if our goal on the other hand is uh, something else, is uh, to uh, develop certain character qualities and virtues, to develop and practice 
uh, the principle of stewardship. Uh, if our goal is to uh, emulate the Trinitarian love of God, if our goal is to make this earth more and more like the kingdom of God, like the kingdom of heaven, uh, well, that might lead us to uh, a very different approach to the production of eggs. Um, and again, you know, if we're going to use Catholic social teaching, we have that principle of stewardship, of caring for the land, of caring for the animals. If we read uh, Wurzba and his image of the communion that there should be between creatures, uh, again, that's probably going to shape our perspective towards the production of eggs. Uh, and so we have these two different sides. We have these two different uh, models. So we could argue about, well, okay, if we accept certain principles, that would lead us to this conclusion or that conclusion. But then there's another question, of course, which is what is our own level of participation? Uh, are, if there's something, is something wrong with the current American aid production model, how responsible are we for that? If we're just consumers who go to the store and buy a dozen eggs, um, are we remotely involved or are we more directly involved in that? Um, and then, of course, there's the question of, do we have an obligation to uh, work to change the system? And if so, uh, how might we do that? Um, as you can probably guess, obviously, I think there is something wrong with the system. I think if you do use... Uh, the principles of natural law and Catholic social teaching, if you accept some of the theological ideas and words, but that there are real problems with uh, this model of egg production, which takes creatures and turns them into uh, basically machines. Now, uh, I'm not a vegetarian or a vegan, uh, but I do think there is a balance to be struck in treating animals as animals respecting their nature, but still recognizing that they are not equal to, uh, excuse me, not equal to humans. Um, but there is a real challenge in, okay, once we recognize this principle, um, what is our obligation, right? There are lots of things that are wrong in our world today. There are lots of products that we uh, purchase that have ethical problems uh, involved in their production. Uh, and it seems plausible to me that it just wouldn't be possible for me to be completely ethical in every purchase I make. Um, my salary being what it is and my family expenses being what they are, uh, things are fairly tight as it is. And so I can't afford to uh, purchase ethical and organic everything. So we have to prioritize. We have to make judgments about how to proceed. Uh, and so basically, uh, we need to... We have a moral obligation to do the best we can to promote the true good of ourselves, uh, of our loved ones, and of others in the world generally. And we have to uh, do the best we can to strike an honest balance of working that out. Now, if there's something uh, directly immoral going on and I'm immediately involved in it, I can't continue doing that regardless of my other concerns. However, if I have a remote degree of cooperation, in an immoral industry. Um, I should work to change it, but I am not morally obligated to stop my participation if that's not really possible for me at the moment. And so the question here is, um, what degree of cooperation do we have uh, and what degree of uh, responsibility do we have for changing things? And if we do want to change things, how could we go about doing that? So those are the questions I have. Uh, those are the questions I'll be asking you on Blackboard as well. I'm also going to give you uh, a short couple of little articles uh, about some uh, Catholic monks who face this issue, uh, and then maybe get uh, your response to their dilemma uh, on Blackboard as well.